Hello. I often wonder, what is the purpose of the perfect pitch? From experience, obviously, it has personally obviously helped me connect to um, the pitches without any lagging, regardless of the sound source, noise source. Um, but I think beyond that um, shortcut to the definition of the pitch, intonation, I find it very um, meaningful for the quality of the touch of the pianist. In other words, the neuron speed between the uh, reading of a music that's written on a score, what you hear, inner ear from what you read, and because of the immediate quality of hearing of the note, of course you don't have to deal on the piano like on string instruments or wind instruments with intonation unless you tune it, but I mean in playing it obviously. I find that people who do have perfect pitch, the teacher I've noticed also, tend to have a more specifically um, researched touch. Perhaps it makes them lazier in a way because in a way the information flows so directly that they don't have to um, format or filter it in order to understand it. Like when you do that with, um, as I taught a lot of when I was young, um, um, ear training solfege, the um, relative pitch. So then you develop an incredible sense in hearing about the intervals. What is a fifth compared to an octave, of course? And then the dissonances, and the sevenths, and the seconds, and the beats of the uh, vibrations. Of course, it depends on the ranges. It's harder to hear F, G flat in the bottom, or C sharp D in the top. Of course, I touch it, so therefore I guess it. But it's not about the guessing game. It's not like um, um, <laughs> spelling B. Uh, in music. It's all about the touch quality, the legato quality. At some dynamic levels I have students who hear better um, the tone they produce. Of course it depends of course of the instrument um, if it's naturally rounded or it needs to be um, voiced um, with holes uh, made in the hammers in order for the uh, felt to snug better the strings. In this case, the sound is more warm. It's like string player who have a meatier tip of fingers, I was told by violin teachers, obtains a warmer tone on the same instrument on a steel string than another. But um, it could be also the question of the um, lips um, texture, thickness, or or softness or wetness when you play the flute, um, any uh, the embouchure, specifically bouche in French mouth, right, the mouthpiece, so that there is always a contact, physical contact for sound production for the instruments, of course the voice naturally it's in us, but um, the wind and the string instruments, they you touch with your body's endings the sound you feel it, you hear it, you, you sense it, either in your side, in your air, air production or in your um, pressure of the fingers on the strings. Um, naturally, with the action of the piano, it's very indirect for a pianist to touch a dynamic range that would have a consequence not after tone. And that has to deal with the decay of the sound, with the acoustics, the instrument itself, the tempo that is suggested by perhaps the atmosphere of the piece, and then the capacity of connecting, if they are to be connected, the sounds taking in at, well, taking 
in account the fact that like this it decays so the next note has to be so softer that it cannot continue at this tempo because then the third note is obviously a hole so therefore an andante or walking or an adagio um, played on a fortepiano on a harpsichord or supposed to have been written for it because it was um, played on a modern piano could be extended artificially unlike bowing or wind uh, playing because after all the phrasings and the groupment of notes in the indication of the score and in the capacity of the player uh, are determined or limited or in fact more than that they are um, formatted and uh, declined by that um, they're not limited at all it's just the way they express themselves so in a way the texture then through the interpretation um, instrumentally speaking the very act of um, the um, craftsmanship of playing uh, the instrument then brings you to the relative with little margin of error right tempo of course in singing you have the fact of the uh, lyrics which um, are even more commanding well the breath naturally is the most commanding but you don't want to run out of breath in the middle of a, of a, of a word um, so that therefore the tempo and the perhaps anxiety that can shorten your breath um, support or yeah um, the pianist accompanying should always of course they do um, adjusts in real time with the unexpected but um, to go back to the original uh, question to myself is what is the purpose of having a perfect pitch I recall when I was a child and I discovered I have a perfect pitch it was because when I was little less than five my first teacher in Sofia uh, Liliana Panayotova she told me at a lesson in her upright old German upright in her apartment um, she taught me do re mi fa sol la si that's obvious to most because of the Guido d'Arezzo's first syllables chosen of um, Gregorian um, chants uh, texts that give a convenient um, consonant opening and vowel second uh, um, word letter combining the capacity to sing and speak do re mi fa sol by having vowels and consonants so it's uh, also for the pitches it used to be called ut for some reason it became do but the other ones re mi fa sol la si were the first syllables of the of the text and um, therefore we all who learn through the solfege notation unlike C D E F G A B C or in German C D E F G A H C or H C hence the B A C H of Bach's name in four letters with the H being the B in in, in German that's complicated I'm confusing things here the nomenclatures but let's say go back to the um, Italian do re mi fa sol la si it was that morning or afternoon whatever it was when I was very young at my first piano lesson that um, these pitches were named by my teacher Mrs. Panayotova and I had no intellectual grasp of what's happening other than she sort of like when you do preset memorization on old fashioned FM radios before digital um, you preset each pitch with a word in fact syllable do re mi fa sol la si and since that day when I hear one of these pitches even if it's a, of course um, all people who have perfect pitch will tell you that it's not really special but it's a fact um, car horn or I don't know boat horn or um, um, police uh, or ambulance um, siren any any sound that has a pitch regarding of its um, timbre of origin that's not obviously instrumental over time it's immediately telling you its name at least it tells it to me 
I hear the word Do when I hear the speech. It's associated to my subconscious. I don't know why, but that's how it was. And I'm sure that is the case for most people. So of course, since I taught very young after Mademoiselle Boulanger, Mademoiselle Dieudonné, well, Mademoiselle Boulanger died in 1979 or 19, um, 15, and uh, then uh, Mademoiselle Dieudonné, who was um, her, um, not really assistant, but her alter ego, could we say, she was the one who was teaching the students of Boulanger uh, music theory basics uh, and um, in depth, <laughs> not just basics, but also in depth. The solfege, uh, French style, which comprehends, of course, ear training, dictation, but also rhythmic dictations, as well as uh, reading in the clefs, the seven, and all this and all that. Mm. I succeeded her uh, in Fontainebleau Summer School, where I used to be a student for almost 10 yeah, summers. And the summer after Mademoiselle Boulanger died, I was the one to teach solfege. Um, but of course, having never studied um, about pitch, since I had perfect pitch, it was just a shortcut to to study with Mademoiselle Dieudonné when I started music, the rhythms, which I heard I had more trouble perceiving um, in a dictation, especially rhythmic dictations and uneven rhythms, not the pulse like dances, but really rhythmic patterns in order to develop imagination as well as capacity of notation in the days before computers then, where you had to write down what perhaps you could improvise on the piano if you do. <laughs> You have to find out if it's double dotted, single dotted, and what kind of notation besides the pitches, obviously. So you could also compose on the table, which was also one thing that was very highly advised by Mademoiselle Boulanger, in order not to just connect the music to the fingers for the pianists. Because then you can write a string quartet and hear the voice leadings or a choir of piece, an SATB, for instance, or regardless, perhaps even a piano piece, but you could also compose it on the piano. I don't think that was an absolute no-no, but it was just more like developing the thought process and as well as the complexity of the thought process in uh, imagining music when you're creative by desire and need, rather than some kind of just let me try style of thing. It wasn't like she obliged me to compose. I arrived to study with her because I was already composing, of course, I was mostly improvising and my father was notating because of his knowledge of solfege since she's my paternal grandmother in rural Bulgaria back in the, before World War II days, um, was a solfege teacher. And so my father's skills of solfege, though he didn't have perfect pitch, he typically had um, actually a very well developed um, relative pitch. He took in dictation my first improvisations when I was five uh, on the upright piano in Sofia's apartment, uh, Petrov, um, Czech Republic instrument, very sweet tone, very sweet tone instrument, always dear to me, still my memories and my heart. Because it's the first instrument where I heard the tones, besides my teacher, Mrs. Panayotova's old Plitner or whatever German brand it was. It was huge, it was looking like, like two refrigerators. It's like one of those old fashioned uprights that have so much resonance because they have such a big case. Um, but for economic reasons of space, most uprights are nowadays, of course, much smaller. <laughs> as the purpose until, of course, now the electric ones or electronic ones, which are, of course, even smaller. But in the acoustic ones, that was the case. So between the two uprights that my parents purchased very expensively and paid for so many years for me uh, in old days Bulgaria before the, uh, well, during rather, uh, the uh, uh, Kurt, um, Iron Curtain um, division of Europe, so it was a big effort and, um, for my parents to me to have an instrument and I realized um, very quickly the capacity of the notes 
uh, that I could imagine through the fingers I could play. Of course, it depended of what piano pieces I was practicing. And inevitably, I was bored immediately after. Not because I was, perhaps I was lazy. But no, I don't think so. Well, I think I was also always, as a child, made sure that I do my practicing. My maternal grandmother was staying home while my, both parents were working in hospital, they're both medical doctors. Daylight, so um, <laughs> daylight time, I had to practice and my grandma had to make sure I do. Um, not many kids know that. It's not like any kid is enjoying practicing. At best, if you have certain kind of facility, in this case the ear, you figure out things and you can fake. That's of course the child doesn't realize it's unnecessary, but it's probably inevitable. But passing through, um, I had home teachers coming to check up on my work and then the weekly lesson with my teacher. So my father had organized a very tight schedule around my learning how to play and because I finished early enough my minuet or whatever Bach other piece I was assigned I would continue the piece because I found that it wasn't enough so I was just not knowing what I was doing when in fact I was improvising but stylistically within that because of my ear that in a way um, guided me just like uh, I guess spotlight in the dark that's exactly what it was. And um, so my father notated my compositions, which in fact were improvisations that were notated, therefore became compositions. And he obliged me to practice them um, like the other piano pieces I was assigned by my teachers, you know, very beginner's pieces. And uh, therefore my pianistic um, level of compositions was also a very beginner pianist. Uh, I also wrote a minuet and all that. But... Um, well, all that. It's not an obligation. I'm just saying that all that because uh, many little pieces was a prayer and there was uh, time passing and all kind of inspirations that somehow came to my little soul when I was five. Um, and my father recorded them on uh, uh, the time there was not even the cassette yet audio which would have been and was since then abandoned, but was to be the modernity. It was still on reel to reel, and then, then he transcribed it by score. I don't know how much because I don't remember the recordings, but um, the discrepancy, how much the filter of his capacity of taking my improvisation on dictation, which was an amazing endeavor anyway, and very much of a self-giving thing for a child that was just perhaps just a blurb in the story but my father took it at heart to uh, not only document it but put it on score so all of a sudden I was practicing along the piano pieces that I was assigned like all kids are assigned also my own pieces which I improvised but of course would have just forgotten like dreams after you wake up um, unless he had notated them after recording them okay so when I arrived to study with Mademoiselle Boulanger and I was seven, seven and a half at some point, eight, eight and a half, nine, with three hours of uh, three times a week um, solfege lessons with Mademoiselle Dieudonné, it pumped up my capacity to develop my hearing, which already the perfect pitch was there since the get-go, but the capacity to notate complex thoughts of um, um, polyphony, as well as, um, but real polyphony, not just thirds of chords, but really two voices, and then three, and not per se harmonically, just triads, or some kind of just, Mademoiselle uh, Boulanger, uh, Mademoiselle Dudonnet, insisted on hearing, hearing in that sense of the word, uh, inner voice hearing, reading hearing, um, and therefore when you play with your ear, then monitoring that you play fugues and perhaps um, motets like birds, have a verum corpus, and hear the voices. Well, 
it's not relative, it's Picardy major third. But um, this kind of exercises between singing, playing, solfeging, fa mi fa do fa, sa fa sol do la, si la si sol do, um, developed my capacity as a little child's curiosity, perhaps, I didn't know if it was creativity really, to which extent do we consider creativity just uh, the fact of imagining something that didn't exist, but nothing is spontaneous generation, everything comes from something you heard, it's almost like composing is a reminiscence of something that somehow comes back to you as if you extracted like earlier I mentioned some kind of dream that comes back to mind after some curious moment during the day reminds you of the dream that you forgot after you woke up or at least my experience so the capacity to um, organize and memorize these um, um, passing thoughts um, of composition or perhaps just this I don't know um, sequence uh, And then the rhythmicity and the dotted rhythm, as I said earlier, or simple. So by the time um, I had these um, intense um, solfege um, developing the ear um, towards um, notating one's thoughts, creative, or perhaps just reading the music that you have to play as a performer, equally. The capacity to decipher really, to, to understand the uh, score page that you see. Of course, then you have to have the analytical skill, which when Mazette Boulanger started very early teaching me, which I adopted in a way for the performer. She was teaching it also mostly for theory students or perhaps for composer students or conductors. It was, we were all a mixed bunch of people. Of course, I was the only child at that time. She used to have children, students from time to time, but um, in the group in her apartment, and of course she was already in her 80s, so she was retired from um, conservatories, uh, but in her uh, weekly lessons in group, um, we were uh, listening and reproducing music and singing these uh, motets and so on. It developed a capacity to analyze how others wrote music and in a way that's how you learn how to write yours also uh, not that you imitate but perhaps you take it as a template and um, the fact that my pianistic abilities developed with the complexities of the technique that I was acquiring like all kids are given always harder piece in order to um, develop more their technique. So every time they're challenged. So equally when I was composing while practicing the piano pieces I was assigned, I was also composing progressively more difficult than I could even play technically, let less notate. And so there was some kind of a very uh, challenging and in a way exciting, but almost scary process that happened in the first few years, let's say between seven and 10 when uh, in these intense uh, music studies of three um, hours uh, lessons three times a week with each of the two demoiselles, Boulanger and Dieudonné, it could appear said like this, and I realize that with time now, 40, 50 years later, that it might have been a little bit uh, forced. You could say that was like forcefully feeding that child so much um, knowledge or know-how or uh, perhaps um, to the point to which you could get the kid disgusted if it's too much of technique and not enough of just free inspiration or some kind of just having fun. Though for me somehow the, uh, but it was perhaps it was me, I don't know if it's the case for most children prodigies with perfect pitch which was my awkward case, but um, there are many cases of kids who, in fact, it helps to have perfect pitch when you're a kid since you play intuitively. Um, so in a way, um, uh, but you can um, and you should not think that of, or assume that all people who are involved in music business after studies, of course, are all with perfect pitch. I mean, they learn their trade through the instruments and then they learn how to tune, they learn the intonation through the perhaps relative pitch or whatever you want to call it, like intervals rather than pitches out of the blue. Uh, but nonetheless, conductors also, uh, perhaps not all conductors here in real time, everything going on in terms of intonation or wrong and right notes or wrong dubbings of notes, not just wrong notes, but 
of course, timbres and combinations. And that is another story because orchestra is polarization of sounds. Uh, piano is a single color of sound. So if you hear this, you hear a dissonance uh, between a piano sound and a piano sound. Of course, you voice it. You hear more the bottom than the top. So you can have shadows and lights, but you really don't have colors like oboe, clarinet, flute, or any other um, coloristic timbre of instrument, which in a way also um, is talking to us as a listener um, through our hearing capacity. Of course, when a composer writes, um, like especially the Renaissance composers wrote a lot of these motets, like uh, the four uh, parts mass by bird, the Kyrie eleison. <clears throat> the way the voices flourish, um, blossom, uh, combine, intertwine, sometimes cross over. The suspensions versus the appoggiaturas, the tension, the releases of the um, uh, harmonic progression through the melodic um, voice leading. And she, Mademoiselle Boulanger, insisted even in simple harmonic progression practices to also play as beautifully expressive. This is one of the first Vidal basses for um, um, six chords or six four chords rather. Of course most students were going Ah parallel no I didn't say that they all played so abrasively loud perhaps but in any way in any case to hear the voicing means you hear the layering at the same time while playing perhaps in two hands, each uh, two parts, tenor bass and then soprano alto. So you, you follow voices while you play chords. It's a way of um, training the ear as I was trained to hear and follow rather, not only hear, I observe, but follow where the voices go, like in a quartet like Mozart. say where obviously the polyphony is it has <laughs> nothing less if it's not it it's nothing but in quartet you also could have chords the result of voice led uh, you know, exchanges of voices for a beautiful voice leading and so in uh, the lessons either we were playing our exercises as a quality motet, even if they were not as beautiful, but um, a bit like people saying, play your cherny etude for a pianist uh, musically, uh, you know what I mean, or and you don't find it always so appealing compared to, I don't know, Chopin etude or something. And so, of course, when you're young and you're very, very young and you don't have that sense of um, effort unless it's nuclear nuclear dimension imposed on you as it was for me you you should say oh with my perfect pitch i can bypass but only cheat myself well when you're seven possibly it's excusable and cutable perhaps but i wasn't allowed beyond that to have such thoughts it was a disgrace to the, to the gift I received, which I was taught by my parents and my teacher to grow up in order to give it to the others constantly, which is what I do through teaching scenes. So in a way, I follow the trace that was sort of drawn for me. And that perfect pitch was some kind of a companion of a way for hearing and sometimes with different intonations. Oops different tunings, oops, especially Baroque tunings, that the perfect pitch is challenged, <laughs> to say the least. 
That's when you prefer to have head, but you don't choose um, a relative pitch where everything is do, re, mi, fa, sol. But anyway, even on the different pitch, as long as it's the steps and the step. Oh well, everybody has a different way to enter into music, but then what a wonderful world to have as a companion through the life. It's a gift that keeps on giving music. Keep humble and work hard and try to improve endlessly. <laughs>